Well, good morning, everyone. Everybody's way back. <laughs> uh, well, good morning and welcome on this uh, beautiful September morning. A little hint of fall in the air, so it's good to have you out. Certainly, if you're visiting with us, glad to have you and uh, hope you'll be back with us when you can. Our uh, scripture reading this morning is from uh, the book of Colossians, and I'll be reading from chapter 3 and verses 23 and through 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the beauty of this day and this time we have to be together. And certainly we know that there's a lot of trouble in our hearts, but uh, we know that we can put those troubles aside as we enter into your comforting presence. And we are thankful that you offer peace and comfort to us as your children by our faith in, Lord, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who told us not to let our hearts be troubled. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Wow, y'all are way back there. <laughs> Good to see all of y'all back there. Appreciate y'all being here this morning. Also, those who are joining us by way of our live stream today, uh, we are grateful for your presence. If you have your Bible with you today, if you just hold it up and keep it up, grass withers, flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. If you are joining us on our live stream today, I would ask you, if you don't mind, uh, to kind of indicate in the comments, number one, that you're here, and also where you are watching from. We would just love to know where all everyone is joining us from this morning. Go ahead and take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 2 to begin with today. Genesis chapter 2. Tomorrow is Labor Day, and so I want to take advantage of that and talk a little bit today about our work whether we have a 9 to 5, some of us are still in that position, or whether we are retired and our work is a little more on our terms than it was before, uh, I think there's still some things we can think about when it comes to magnifying Christ with our work. Our theme this year is magnifying Him. So how can we glorify God with our job? How can we serve God with our work? How can we view our work as a form of worship? Believe it or not, the Bible actually has a lot to say about our work. Right here in Genesis 2 that I've had you turn with me uh, toward, there, the word work is found for the very first time in all of the Bible. We'll look at the verse in just a minute. But the Hebrew word that's translated work, the interesting thing to me is, it shares the same root as the Hebrew word for worship. I think that's interesting. There is a sense in which by doing the work that God put him in the Garden of Eden to do, Adam was worshiping God. When you think about the parables that Jesus told, I don't think it's a coincidence that the vast majority of them have a workplace context. Jesus was interested in our work. If you look at the 40 miracles that are recorded in the book of Acts, 39 of them occur outside of a church setting. That tells me that as much as God is concerned about displaying His power within the walls of a building like this, when the church gathers, He's even more so interested in displaying His power outside the walls of this building. And I can't think of any more powerful context for His power to be displayed than in the place where we spend a lot of our time, and that is in our work. And so this morning, I want you to think with me about five ways we can magnify Christ at work. Five ways we can view our work, whatever it is, as worship. Here's the first thing that I want you to notice with me from Scripture this morning. Worshipful work fulfills God's purposes in creation. In other words, when we view our work the way we should, and when we view it as something by which we actually worship God, in a sense... We're doing what God put us here to do. We're fulfilling the very purpose that God put us on this planet to fulfill. I want you to look at this passage in Genesis 2 with me. Genesis 2 and verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man, Adam, and he put him in the Garden of Eden, notice, to work it 
and to keep it. God creates Adam. He says, all right, Adam, here's your assignment in the garden. I want you to work it, and I want you to keep it. And by the way, notice this is before Genesis 3. This is still Genesis 2. The fall happens in Genesis 3, and all of the things God gives as consequences for the fall are Genesis 3. Work was not given as a punishment because of the fall. Work was part of God's original plan before the fall. And so he says to Adam, Adam, here's your job. I want you in the garden to work it and keep it. The word for work there is a word that means to prepare or to develop. In other words, God was saying, Adam, I've put you where I put you, and now your job is to take the raw materials that I have created and I want you to take that, and I want you to use it. I want you to develop it, and I want you, in doing that, to glorify me and to do good for the world. That was Adam's assignment. And, and there's a sense in which, when you read Genesis, that when Adam did that, he was sort of a co-creator with God, in the sense that God was working with him, he was working with God, God was working through him as he took what God had created and developed it and prepared it. The same thing is true for you and for me. Uh, Adam was not to be a park ranger in the garden. Park rangers just sort of guard everything and make sure it's good. Adam was put there to be a gardener, to take it and to develop it. You and I are not park rangers of God's creation. We're to be gardeners. In other words, we're to take what God has created and we are to use it and we are to develop it and we're to prepare it in a way that brings God glory and that is actually beneficial to other people. That's our task. And the key is, when we do that, just like Adam, there's a sense in which we're working with God. And he's working with us and through us. There's a partnership between us and God. And because of that, there's a sense of divine satisfaction that, that you know, I'm doing what God put me here to do. I'm fulfilling his purpose in, in, in his creation. But I do need to give you a word of clarification this morning. Work was not a, a consequence of the fall, but one of the curses of the fall was that work changed. And work became toilsome. You remember? God cursed the ground. He said that thorns and thistles would frustrate our efforts. And, and from then on, work became sort of a compulsory act of survival. This is what we do to survive. For many of you this morning, that may be kind of how you view your job, your work. You know, it's, it's maybe partially fulfilling, but it's, there's a lot of toil and it's really kind of burdensome sometimes. Maybe, maybe you hate your job completely. Maybe you can't stand anything about it. So what do you do when you're in a job like that? What do you do when your work is like that? Well, I think there's, there's still a sense in which you can faithfully do what it is you've been called on to do in your work because you're helping somebody. And what you're doing is serving somebody. And I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. So I think you can look at it that way. And, and even though you may not find complete fulfillment in it, you, you, can, you, can, you can view it that way. But maybe something else would be helpful for you to think about. Maybe you need to make a distinction between your job and your calling. There might need to be a distinction between your job and your calling. Think about the Apostle Paul. His calling was to be the apostle to the Gentiles, right? To take the good news to the Gentiles. That was his calling. Paul also made tents. Making tents was a part of his calling, in a sense, but it wasn't the heart of his calling. His calling was to take the good news to the Gentiles. This task of making tents is sort of what he used to enable him to fulfill his calling. And so maybe if you're in a, in a job or work that's not really what you'd want it to be and it's burdensome and it's toilsome and it's partially fulfilling or maybe you hate it all together maybe it would help to view your work and your job different from your calling how can I leverage what I'm doing to fulfill why God's put me here to fulfill the calling he has on my life maybe you're one of those rare people where you found a job that absolutely fits your calling and you found it early on and you need to thank God for that that is a blessing. Thank Him for it. Worshipful work fulfills God's purposes 
in creation. Let me give you a second thing this morning about our worshipful work. When we view our work as a form of worship, it pursues the highest standards of excellence. What I mean by that is, if we view our work the way we should, it's an offering to God. And because of that, we want to give the best that we can give. Here's the text that Steve read for us earlier in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. That's what Paul says. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you're going to receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. He says it several times because I think he wants us to see it. See, you've got a higher boss than your employer, whoever that is. And you work for a greater reward than your salary. Paul says we do what we do as for the Lord, which means the way we do what we do makes a statement about how worthy we believe God is. The way we work and how we view our work and how we do our work shows that we value and we honor Him. And it shows how worthy we think He is. Because ultimately it's about Him. It's not about the person that signs your check. Somebody says, but Mark, you don't know my boss. (laughs) No, I don't know your boss. You say, man, my boss is terrible. My, My boss doesn't. They don't reward me the way they should. They don't even recognize that I'm there. You don't know my boss. No, I don't know your boss. And and look, I know sometimes those situations are hard. We've all been in them, right? But what Paul is saying is, ultimately, your boss is not that employer. That that person is not... The, the, the motivation for your doing what you're doing. Yeah, they may, you may look at them and, and you may think, oh, I don't, why would I be motivated to work for this person? They're terrible. That's really not your motivation. That person's not your motivation. You're working as for the Lord. It is about Him, not about that person. And Paul says, this is the thing that makes Christians different. This is the thing that sets us apart. Whatever we do, whether we eat, whether we drink, whether we mop the floors, whether we write contracts, whatever it is that we do, we do everything for the glory of God. In everything we do, we say, Lord, this is a statement about how worthy I think you are. And I'm doing this for you. I want to say something to our our students. We've got some students here physically, and I know we've got some that are watching on the live stream as well. I want to say something to our students this morning. It's a new school year. Anybody want to agree that it's been different? (laughs) It's been been different, y'all. It's just been different. We've experienced it in our home. Y'all have in yours as well. Let me me challenge the students. Y'all are not going to like me for this, but it's okay. You still love me, right? You'll still love me. Uh, We tell tell our daughter this. We say, look, Faith, schoolwork is hard. Schoolwork gets tough. And and I bet some of y'all already are sick of it. You're just tired of it. You're tired of it. I know you are. I know you are. We, We try to tell our daughter, look, right now your school is your job. This is your job. Look at it like it's your job. This is what you need to do. And so approach it that way. It's not always going to be something you enjoy. It's not always going to be something you, you, you love to do. You're, you're not always going to make straight A's. Not everybody's going to be the straight A student, and that's okay. But you can work hard at what you do. And right now all the students are going, no, boo, boo, preacher, boo, I don't like this. No, you can, you can work hard at what you do. Because what you're doing is a statement about saying, okay, Lord, I'm doing this as a statement about how worthy I think you are. I'm honoring you by the way I'm going to do this. We all need to do that in whatever our work is. Worshipful work pursues the highest standards of excellence, whatever that might look like. Let me give you a third thing. When we view our work this way, worshipful work actually also reflects the highest standards of ethics. In other words... We're going, to, we're going to do our work with integrity and honesty, and we're going to be the kind of ethical people we need to be because we view our work as a reflection of our God. They tell a story about Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who worked in the British government 
uh, that he one time played a practical joke on 12 very prominent British citizens. Uh, he decided to send them a telegram, and in the telegram, it was, it, he sent it anonymously. They didn't know who it was from, but it, they could tell it was an official government telegram. It was from inside the government. And this is all Sir Arthur Conan Doyle said in this telegram to these 12 people. He said, flee at once. All is discovered. He said it to 12 people. He said, flee at once. All is discovered. He checked back with the, the 12 people he sent it to. In about six hours, all 12 of them were making plans to leave. <laughs> I mean, they, they figured, oh, well, you know, everybody knows what I'm doing. Evidently, they weren't doing what they ought to be doing, right? Lack of integrity is nothing new when it comes to work. Uh, it, it's been there for a long time. But work that magnifies Christ is different. Because it says, I want my work to reflect the justice of God and the integrity of God. Business ethics matters to us because our work is done for God. And our ethical practices reflect God. Proverbs 11, 1 is the passage I want to use with this point. The wise man says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. A false balance uh, that doesn't mean a lot to us, but let me put it in context for you. A false balance for them would have been scales that had been weighted in favor of the business person that would sort of cheat the consumer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take advantage of you by kind of putting the balance off a little bit so that things are in my favor and I'm going to take advantage of you. For us, it wouldn't be a false balance. For us, it might be things like, you know, fudging your business mileage or or fudging your expense account, or, you know, kind of fudging your time card at work, or, or, you know, calling in sick when you're not sick, or something like that, right? A false balance. Notice he says, that's an abomination to God. I don't have to tell you, that word abomination is used elsewhere in Scripture in connection with some pretty bad stuff <laughs> that God hates. And he says, look, I hate, fall, I hate business ethics that are not what they should be. I hate dishonest business practices. Our, our ethics need to rise above that. I said in the first service, I wish it weren't true, but, but it, it, it is. I've heard it from so many Christians over the years who have said that they would rather not do business with other Christians. And the reason they give is because when they know I'm a Christian and they're a Christian, they try to take advantage of me. They don't do the work they ought to do in the timely way they ought to do it. They, they ask for free stuff. They just take advantage of the situation. They take shortcuts because, hey, it's another believer, another Christian. And they, these are not worldly people talking about other worldly people. These are Christians talking about other Christians. I'd rather not do business with another Christian. Man, I hope that's never true of us. I hope nobody would ever say that about us. Instead... I hope Psalm 15, 1 to 3 is what would characterize our lives. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly, does what's right, speaks truth in his heart, doesn't slander with his tongue, does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. Worshipful work reflects the highest standards of ethics. Let me give you a fourth thing. Worshipful work makes blessing others its bottom line. To follow Jesus means that we think the way Jesus thought and we act the way Jesus acted. Well, Jesus' life was poured out for other people, to bless other people. That's how our lives will be too when we view our work that way. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake... He became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Paul says Jesus leveraged his assets. He leveraged his position of strength in order to benefit other people. You, you, that's what you do when you follow Jesus. You begin to leverage your places of strength to bless and to serve other people. You say, Mark, what does that look like? I can't tell you in your life what that looks like, specifically, because all of our circumstances... They're just very different. It might just mean for you that you leverage your attitude at work 
when you're working. Uh, what difference would it make in a workplace environment when there's someone in that environment that just works with an attitude of joy? It's just different when you see them, right? And if y'all have been in a workplace where you didn't have that, it makes a difference when it's there. And so maybe, maybe that's what we need to do to say, you know what? leveraging my assets and leveraging my place of strength right now is just to say, you know what, I'm going to work with the right attitude. I'm going to work with an attitude of joy. Maybe for you, it means literally that you leverage your assets. And you look at your bottom line, and instead of being concerned just about your own personal situation financially, you say, you know what, I'm going to leverage that to bless other people through giving through your church family, or through giving to other ministries in our community, uh, like Full Circle. Many of you were a part of Full Circle's banquet last week, and the things that went on there, they did, from what I understand, they did phenomenal this year. And that's because people were generous. They leveraged their assets and said, you know what, it's not just about me. It is about blessing other people. That's what we do when we view our work in a worshipful way. And again, I don't know what that would look like for you. I can't tell you what that looks like for you. But the idea is you take your resources, you take what you have, you take your places of strength, and you use that. You leverage that to bless other people. Worshipful work makes blessing others its bottom line. And then last of all this morning, worshipful work seeks to advance Jesus' mission where it can. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature, right? Jesus' mission is to spread the good news about himself throughout this world. Worshipful work recognizes that and says, you know what, there is a greater motive here than just me punching this clock. I want to advance the mission of Jesus. The problem is we often wonder how can we do that at work, right? How can we, how can we mix work with advancing the mission of Jesus? And it can be challenging. Here's what I would say to you. If you're doing the first four things that we just talked about this morning, and you're really living that out in your workplace, I promise you, you're going to be marked as different. You just are. I promise you, people are going to notice there's something different about you. If you're working with integrity and joy, and, and you're... you're, you're, you're seeking to bless other people by what you do, and you're fulfilling your purpose in Christ. I promise you if you do that, it's going to be different, and people are going to notice it. 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Man, when you're, when you're honoring Christ in the, those four ways we just talked about, somebody's going to notice that. Somebody's going to notice that you work differently. Someone's going to notice, man, you, you seem to have a purpose and a joy that I don't have. How do, you, how do you deal with mistreatment with such grace? Because you're going to get mistreated at work sooner or later. How do you deal with mistreatment with such grace? I struggle with that. How do you do that? And then you get to point them to Jesus. You get to point them to the Lord. Is that happening in your business? Do you work so hard with such excellence and such integrity and such grace that people sense a reality of a heavenly kingdom, something different about you, and they just want to ask? In other words, don't see your work as an end in itself, but see your work as a means to an end. The goal is the advancement of Jesus' kingdom. Look for those opportunities and look for those doors because worshipful work seeks to advance Jesus' mission where it can. I want to wrap all this up this morning by giving you a word of warning, all right? We've said all this about our work and how important our work is and how we can leverage our work and use it as, as, as a means to advance the kingdom. Let me give you a word of warning. Worship God, not your work. Worship God, do not worship your work. I go again back to the fall in the Garden of Eden. That changed things as far as our relationship to our work is concerned. And since then, we've really struggled with viewing our work the way we should. And we've come to lean on work in a couple of ways that probably we shouldn't. We lean on our work for our identity. 
and it can become something that is idolatry identity and idolatry what do you mean mark i mean we come to view our worth based on our work and our status at work or maybe we come to view our identity by the fact we don't have to work anymore hey i'm done with that and that's called our identity right identity identity and then there's idolatry where we may come to view our work and the security our work provides us, hey, this is what's going to take care of me in the future, this job and all the benefits of this job. Identity and idolatry. Listen, you are not what you do. You are not what you do. Your identity is found in Christ. And your work makes a terrible God. (laughs) God makes a pretty good God. Your work makes an absolutely terrible God. He is the one you can depend on. He has already, think about this, He has already taken care of your ultimate problem, which is not a lack of money or a lack of status. Your ultimate problem is sin and death, and He has already taken care of that. If He will take care of that, then won't He take care of your day-to-day needs? Don't, don't look to your work for your identity. Don't look to your work to, for your security. Find those things in Christ and then enjoy your work. And that's kind of what I'd leave you with. When Jesus is your life, you can enjoy the rest of your life. When I find my identity and my security and all of that in Christ and it's grounded in Christ, now I can enjoy my job because I'm not looking at it to provide things for me. It never was intended to provide. So I guess the question is, is Jesus your life? Is Jesus your life? Maybe today the answer to that is yes, but you've been viewing your work in a way that's not healthy. You've tried to find your identity in what you do. You've tried to find your security in what you do. Let me challenge you, look to Christ for that today. If you need us to pray for you and you're here Our shepherds will be glad to pray with you after this service. If you're watching on Facebook today, just indicate in the comments if you'd like or if it's private, send me a private message. We'll pray for you. If you're struggling with this, maybe something's going on at work, we'd love to pray with you any way we can. Or maybe today when I ask you, is Christ your life, you have to say no. He's really not. I want to tell you more about Jesus today. If you're watching again on our live stream, send me a message. I want to tell you how he can be your life so you can put the rest of your life in perspective. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you for this look at our work. God, help us to view it the way you view it, whether it's a nine to five, whether it's we've transitioned into another role and and place in our life and now our work is different. But God, help us to view what we do in a healthy way. Help us to view it through your lens. Help us to find our worth and our value, our identity and our security in you. And then God, help us to enjoy the rest of our life. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for your grace. And it's in Jesus' name today that we pray. Amen. Go ahead and get your communion elements if you would. Uh, Robbie Nesbitt is going to come. And he's going to lead us as we think about what Jesus has done so that we can find our rest in him. Robbie? We don't have to look very far to see how things are in this world today. This past week in my Bible study, I did a word search on the word generation. What what the Bible said about the word generation, I didn't get out of Matthew. In the book of Matthew, it says this is a twisted generation. Jesus was speaking to the people in his time. He called it an adulterous generation. He called it a generation of vipers. And I was, you know, that's kind of depressing to think that that's kind of what he thought about the generation at that time. I don't think that's too far off where we are today. Things are kind of twisted right now. Things are kind of mixed up, mangled up. And I walk out this morning out the door and that, that cool air hits me and I begin to thinking about fall. Begin thinking about Thanksgiving and Christmas and football and all that good stuff. 
You know, it's my favorite time of the year. And, uh, and I got to thinking about Christmas there a little bit. And uh, in the very first chapter of Matthew, when we think about Christmas, a lot of times we think about the birth of Jesus. And it says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And then going on down in verse or two, it says this was uh, done so that the prophecy would be fulfilled that said this, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear him a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So in the generation that is twisted, in the generation that's broken, in the generation that we're living in today, just like they lived in back then, Jesus is the answer. He'll be with us. He'll save us from our sins. After Jesus had lived on the life, after they misunderstood his mission, after they had crucified him, hung him on the cross, after his resurrection, the Apostle John writes this in the first chapter of 1 John. He says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. It doesn't matter what the sin is. His blood cleanses us from all sin. Jesus is the answer. And going on down a couple of verses, it kind of repeats the same thing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's nothing more powerful on this earth than the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing has ever been, nothing ever will be more powerful than the blood of Jesus Christ that brings us back to God, that gives us the answer what we need for the generations that we live in. This is what we're going to do now, is to remember that sacrifice. If you would take your cups, the bread. We'll have a prayer for the bread. Father, we thank you for this day and the many blessings of life that you give us. We're thankful for this time we've had to come to worship you in song and hear a message from your word about how we are to be. Father, we're most thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that reconciles all the broken things in this world, that allows us to come back to you, that cleanses us, that paid the ultimate price for our sins. Father, now I pray as we partake this bread, we'll be mindful that it represents his body that hung on the cross. I pray that you would bless this loaf as we partake it, and that you would bless us. It's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll have a prayer for the cup. Once again, Father, we come before you thanking you for the many blessings. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus. We're thankful for the, the cleansing fountain that it is that cleanses us from our sins, that cleanses us from unrighteousness, that allows us to call you Father, that allows you to call us your children. Father, I pray that you would bless this cup that represents that blood as it was shed and that you would bless us as we partake. It's through his name we pray. Amen. Once again, we are just grateful for your presence today, and uh, we are, we're honored that you have joined us for worship, those who have been here physically and those who have joined us on our live stream today. Thank you for being a part of our worship. Before we dismiss today, I want to mention just a few things. 
that we need to be aware of this week. Please do remember those who are traveling uh, over this uh, Labor Day holiday. I know that there, even with the virus going on, there are a lot of folks that are going to see family and such. So please remember, uh, remember the folks that are traveling. In light of uh, Labor Day tomorrow, the office will be closed. So please take note of that. Uh, next Sunday night, not tonight because of the, the holiday, but next Sunday night, uh, we're going to start doing something on Sunday night that really is something we kind of were already doing, but we're going to transition it and do it in a little bit different uh, a way. Um, those of you who remember back pre-COVID, uh, stuff happened pre-COVID. I know it's hard to imagine that. But uh, back before COVID hit, we on Sunday nights in the auditorium had what I called overflow, which was a time where we went a little deeper into application of what we talked about that morning. It's I, th I think it's easy just to come and to hear and to listen and to think, you know, that's really good stuff. But then we, we go and we get involved in our life and we really don't do a lot with what we hear. And so Overflow is going to be designed to help us to put some feet, to put some, some shoe leather on what we talk about on Sunday morning. Now, it will not be a physical gathering. Uh, it will be a virtual gathering. I'll share more details about that uh, next Sunday morning. But I'm excited about that and I hope it will help us to live out the word in our lives but I'll be talking more about that next Sunday morning uh, September the 20th uh, barring any changes which in 2020 this is the year of change <laughs> right you don't you don't make a whole lot of firm plans but as of now our shepherds are planning on September 20th going back to one service there will be no nine o'clock service beginning September the 20th uh, we will all be gathering here at 10 30 it will continue to be live streamed on both zoom and facebook live but that is the goal if anything changes we will let you know about that as you leave today if you haven't had a chance yet there is a basket on the table where you can our members can give their contribution if you'd like to do that uh, also, there is a trash can to outside the door to your right, and you can put your communion elements there. Again, we are glad that you're here. We're grateful for your presence today. Shane Sewell is going to come and lead us in our closing prayer, and then we'll go and we'll magnify Christ this week. Shane. One quick thing before we have our closing prayer. Um, we are working on kind of ideas of what Sunday school would look like and what we're going to do. Um, we've talked through some things. We don't have a definitive plan. We're working through that, respectful of all the, the situation that's going on and concerns that, that people may have about uh, that. But we are working on a plan. And I say that to say, if you would be interested in teaching in some form, if you will let me know, you can reach out to me by text or email or phone call. Uh, I'm just trying to get a list together as we put together these plans, and so if you're interested in that or would be willing to do that, please let me know, and then we'll have some more information from there. Let's bow as we prepare to close. Dear Holy Father, we just come to you, and we are in awe of all that you do. Um, Lord, as we go through this change of season, as fall is upon us, uh, help us to step back and uh, just appreciate your creation and your work um, as our seasons change, and we just thank you for that and the beauty of your creation. We thank you that we've had the opportunity to gather here um, as a congregation of family in person or virtually. Um, and Lord, please help us to never take that for granted that we have the freedom to do that. Lord, we thank you um, for um, all your many blessings. Lord, we do know there are many in our church family that are struggling. We want to continue to pray for uh, the family of Bill Martin and his passing. Uh, be with them and comfort them during this time. We continue to pray for um, the Mayberry family and the passing of Robert. Would we pray for comfort and strength for them during this time, Lord, and as they grieve. Um, and we pray that we would be there and we would be um, a blessing to them in whatever way that we can. Lord, we uh, know that there are many that are dealing with uh, sickness from the, the virus and we pray for recovery for them. Lord, we ultimately pray for a vaccine uh, and for uh, that will help us to uh, get back to uh, a normal way of living, Lord, and we pray that that would come quickly. Uh, we pray for our shepherds here as they guide us. Um, we ask for wisdom for them and knowledge, and we thank you for their willingness to, to serve us um, in their position of leadership. Uh, Lord, we um, thank you for Mark uh, and Travis as they minister to us and their families. Uh, we thank you for the lesson that Mark brought. I know on a personal level it's very uh, beneficial to me and 
I pray that it is to, to others as well and help us to um, live our lives and do our work in a way that magnifies you um, always, Lord. Lord, most of all, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and his willingness to go to the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we sin and fall short each and every day, and we uh, thank you for the forgiveness that Christ's shed blood provides to us. Lord, as we leave here today, uh, we do ask that you continue to watch over our students, um, our teachers and administrators um, throughout schools at all level. Um, we pray for protection, Lord, um, over them, and uh, we just pray your, your watch and care over them. Lord, watch over all of us, protect us, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.